with the town. If life has become unmanageable and you want to live without it being necessary with these drugs, we have found a way. Here are the 12 steps of Narcotics Anonymous that we use on a daily basis to help us overcome our disease. One, we admitted that we were powerless over our addiction, that our lives had become unmanageable. Two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood. Four, we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Five, we admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, we were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects in character. Seven, we humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, we made a list of all persons he had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Nine, we made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except to do so would injure them or others. Ten, we continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Eleven, we sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Twelve, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to addicts and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Recovery doesn't stop with just being clean. As we abstain from all drugs, and yes, this means alcohol and marijuana too, we come face to face with feelings that we have never coped with successfully. We even experience feelings we were not capable of having in the past. We must become willing to meet old and new feelings as they come. We learn to experience feelings and realize they can do us no harm unless we act on them. Rather than acting on them, we call in an a member if we have feelings we cannot end. By sharing, we learn to work through it. Chances are they've had a similar experience and can relate what worked for them. Remember, an addict alone is in bad company. The 12 steps, new friends, and sponsors all help us deal with these feelings. In NA, our joys are multiplied by sharing good days. Our sorrows are lessened by sharing the bad. For the first time in our lives, we don't have to experience anything alone. Now that we have a group, we are able to develop a relationship with a higher power that can always be with us. We suggest that you look for a sponsor as soon as you become acquainted with the members in your area. Being asked to sponsor a new member is a privilege, so don't hesitate to ask someone. Sponsorship is a rewarding experience for both. We are all here to help and be helped. We who are recovering must share with you what we have learned in order to maintain our growth in the NA program and our ability to function without the drugs. This program offers hope. All you have to do, all you have to bring with you is the desire to stop using and the willingness to try this new way of life. Come to meetings, listen with an open mind, ask questions, get phone numbers, and use them. Stay clean just for today. May we also remind you that this is an anonymous program and your anonymity will be held in the source of confidence. We are not interested in what or how much you use or who your connections were, what you have done in the past, how much or how little you have, but only in what you want to do about your problem and how we can help. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Cheryl. Topic for today's meeting is... Traditions one, two, three, and four. And if you could all help me welcome our speaker, Karen. I guess it was another quarter. I'm an addict. My name is Karen here. And I want to start by saying thank you to the committee for asking me to speak today. It's a privilege to be here and it's a privilege to have gotten clean in the what was the Connecticut area when I first got here and later transcended into the Hartford area and grew from there. Um, I got clean on December 1st, 1982. There was two meetings in the state of Connecticut, maybe three. The New Haven area, the New Haven area of the state, not the New Haven area at the time, had orange and wall. And the Tuesday night meeting in Newington was going on, and there was a meeting in Waterbury. And in those days, we used to tremble the state. Because early on, I became very impassioned with Narcotics Anonymous, and I didn't want to go anywhere else. And those early days, you know, we did a lot of things wrong. And I'm not a traditionalist. I believe in the traditions. I believe that our predecessors were very brilliant in setting down these, these spiritual principles that guide the groups but also can apply to our lives. But I, you know, don't actively always say that I'm living, for instance, the first tradition in my life, although I really try to do that on a regular basis. Uh, unity, you know, our our 
our personal recovery does depend on unity and our common welfare needs to come first because without that, Narcotics Anonymous can disintegrate. And for me, I believe that without the steps in my life and without having internalized the steps over and over and over again, it is next to impossible for me to live the traditions. You know, anonymity runs through all the traditions. And without having worked on my ego, it's almost impossible for me to be anonymous. The core value of anonymity means that we're selfless. And selflessness has a big role in the first tradition because, you know, we need to think of ourselves less to put the common welfare, the best well-being of Narcotics Anonymous has to come from me being selfless. When I go to a service meeting, when I go to my home group, it's not all about me. It's about the group. It's about the newcomer. What can I do to make the newcomer feel more welcome? What can I do to ensure that Narcotics Anonymous will be here next year? You know, the atmosphere of recovery has to come first. I'm very saddened because right now in my area in Daytona Beach, there's things going on that's very disunifying. There's been violence in our meetings. And, you know, it's a very difficult thing when, when that happens, especially in a meeting of recovery. And it has the potential to have the worst kind of ripple effect that, you know, can affect the other traditions. You know, it can affect any as a whole, the fourth tradition, when we don't when we don't think about what my behavior is doing to Narcotics Anonymous as a whole. And, you know, I love Narcotics Anonymous. I used to work for NAWS. I have a lot of experience doing public relations for Narcotics Anonymous. And it breaks my heart when I see bad behavior happening. Because, you know, where I come from, in Daytona Beach, it's a very small town, really. It doesn't always appear that way because it's a very transient place and there's a lot of tourists and we get lots of people in and out. And, and yet, you know, where we have our meetings, those people talk to each other. And because they're very, you know, they're very collaborative. And if, a meeting does something to harm Narcotics Anonymous as a whole, it can really harm Narcotics Anonymous as a whole because they talk to each other. So violence in our meetings, you know, not only hurts the newcomer, not only hurts the old timer, but it can hurt Narcotics Anonymous as a whole because we might lose our meeting place. And, you know, in the It Works How and Why talks about you know, Narcotics Anonymous from the perspective of our neighborhoods. And we have to always consider where we are and the effect that our behavior has, you know, on our neighborhood, on our meetings, you know. And for me, I think it's a sponsor's responsibility to remind people about our behavior, you know. The second tradition one of the spiritual principles is integrity. You know, from a personal perspective, when I go into a service meeting or I go into any situation, you know, whether it's my home group, whether it's at area service, when I'm asked to fill in for our GSR or whatever, I, you know, have to invite a loving God into the process of my daily life. And that includes service. You know, God is the ultimate authority. And when I think about when I'm going to share at a meeting or when I think about when I open the meeting at my home group, I have to really ask myself when stuff happens, you know, the first question that I have to ask myself is what would a loving God want me to do? It's part of my third step and it is part of my second tradition that you know, I have to get quiet enough 
and step back. You know, my sponsor Judy always says, stop, look, and listen. And, you know, if I can stop, look, and listen enough and really think about is what I'm going to say going to go against the first tradition or any of the traditions? You know, is what I'm going to say going to hurt another addict? Then I should really keep my mouth shut. (laughs) You know, sometimes that's still really hard for me to do. You know, I'm still very opinionated. I still have an ego, but ego has no place, you know, in a service meeting, really in an NA meeting at all. You know, it's not about me. I like to say that. It's just not about me. It is about the sick and suffering addict. You know, the other thing that I really try to remember when I look at the traditions is, is what we're doing going to be the best thing for the addict that comes in next year, you know, or five years from now or 10 years from now? When I got here, we, you know, we were pretty clueless. You know, we didn't really have a lot of experience in the steps. We did a lot of things wrong, you know, because we so wanted our own identity in Narcotics Anonymous that we ended up hurting some people in the beginning. You know, I was one of, I'm sorry to say that I was one of the original purists, and we jammed the traditions down your throat. We jammed our language down your throat, and, you know, we we did some damage. And that's not okay today. You know, I try if someone, you know, is using outside language, you know, I don't fuck people off anymore. I may, you know, pull somebody aside and say, you know, our language is this. And we read the clarity statement in my home group because, you know, it's one way to get the message out that, you know, Narcotics Anonymous is its own fellowship. Narcotics Anonymous is, has its own language and our own steps. You know, our steps are different than other fellowships. Our steps go very deep. And, you know, I will be forever grateful for the foundation that I have because I don't know really how some people do it anymore. You know, the, And I don't want to turn this into a soapbox, which I could easily do, because there's many things that bother me today at times about the way things are run, the way things happen. You know, um, I, I, I find the steps are a sacred thing from God and our readings, you know, came from blood, sweat and tears. You know, I know some of the people that worked hard to put our literature together. My sponsor, my late sponsor, was one of those addicts that had a passion for literature. And she gave me that passion as well. You know, and I'm happy to say that I, you know, have a little bit of input into some of our literature today. And that's so important to me. You know, I had the opportunity and the privilege to live in Japan for eight months when I had 18 years clean. And it was at a time in the Japanese fellowship that they didn't have the basic text translated. You know, NAS has a mission statement today that, you know, the dream of Narcotics Anonymous is that every addict in the world can hear the message of recovery in their own language and culture. You know, that's an incredible dream for us to have. You know, this isn't just about the Hartford area. It isn't just about the Daytona area or the Connecticut region or the Florida region or even the United States. It's about a worldwide fellowship. And our founders had the presence of mind to give us the traditions so that we, as a fellowship, could move beyond Southern California. You know, I had the privilege of living where Narcotics Anonymous started in Southern California for 15 years. And they didn't have all the answers either. Mm. None of us do, you know, and that's the part of the traditions. You know, none of us have all the answers. That's why God is the ultimate authority and not Karen. And so, you know, as 
except in Bob's life, <laughs> then I am the ultimate authority. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want this to be a dry, you know, workshop. <laughs> you know, those of you in the room that know me know that, you know, I've been in a relationship for 20, almost 24 years. And without the steps and the traditions, you know, like in a relationship, you have to think about what's the, what is the common welfare in my relationship? You know, what is... What can I do for the greater good uh, with my sponsees, with my husband, with my friends, with my family? You know, the traditions have taught me how to put myself in a place of humility, in a place of, you know, what is the best, what is the common good here? What is the overall well-being? The wonderful thing about living in Japan is it's a consensus-based society. And so, you know, and really, unless you, everybody in the room agrees, nothing gets done. <laughs> How we built what we built over there is a miracle because, you know, two cultures came together in my work environment and we built something really wonderful, but it took a lot of work to come to consensus. And I was able to apply that, you know, looking at what's the big picture. I learned that in the steps and in service and what's the best thing for everybody involved, not just one person. And that's the essence of the traditions for me. You know, I love the third tradition because it frees, it gives us freedom from judgment. You know, having a tradition that says the only requirement for membership is the desire to stop using means that any person can walk through that door and say they're a member. And it frees me from saying, he's never going to make it. You know, or she, you know, she didn't really use. It's none of my business. You know, it's none of my business to judge whether or not somebody is, you know, a a gold card carrying member. <laughs> and even though some people, you know, like to say that they are a gold card carrying member, you know, I feel that way sometimes because I don't go anywhere else. My recovery is in Narcotics Anonymous. And that's what I believe in. And that's what I do. And that's what I give back to. And that's where my passion lies. But it's not up to me to say whether someone should be a member or not. You know, God gave us this program, I believe, and anyone can walk through that door and say, you know, I'm here, I want help. And then it becomes my responsibility to be there to help the person walking in that door, like Denise. (laughs) 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 Sorry. And, you know, so the third tradition is about being all-inclusive. It's about ha- not having judgment. It's, it's about, you know, I am responsible for, for when someone reaches out to me for help. And that's why, you know, I still go to meetings. I have a home group. I'm the secretary of my home group because... You know, for a lot of reasons, one of which I, the church entrusted me with the key and no one else. I had to sign in blood for that key, you know, and I take that very seriously, you know, so and it keeps me plugged into my home group to have that responsibility. And, you know, which brings me to the fourth tradition that, you know, every group is autonomous except when to do so you know, affects any as a whole. If we're doing something in our meeting that hurts Narcotics Anonymous, then it goes against the fourth tradition. And so, you know, we each have our own little spin on things. When I left Connecticut and moved to L.A., I went into a huge culture shock with the meetings, and I was very like, oh, they're not doing it right. You know, what moving moving gives you and living in another country gives you is the knowledge that 
every meeting is different. Every area is different. Regions are different. Parts of the world are different. You know, in Japan, the word God doesn't translate into Japanese, but they found a way around that. You know, they still have a God of their understanding in their culture and in their meetings and in the way they translate their literature. And, you know, it's an important thing. But my home group, you know, I helped start my home group as a survival tactic because some of the meetings in Daytona were kind of chaotic and I'm old now and I don't like chaos. (laughs) Um, I don't. You know, and it's funny because when I got here, I was pretty wild and crazy. There's not too many people left around that remember me when I got clean in 1982. But I was, you know, pretty wild. Um, And But now that I'm, you know, I have 27 and a half years clean and I'm in my 50s, I like quiet. And... (laughs) I have a hard time focusing when people are jumping around and shouting things out. And, you know, it's partially because I have a lot of respect for our readings. And I know people that come to the rooms and they don't know how to read or they can't hear very well. And so... You know, for me to shout out something during those readings means that maybe there's an addict in the room that isn't going to get the message because we're hooting and hollering during our important readings. And while I don't want to be on a soapbox about it, I think it's really important to remember that what you're screaming out may prevent someone from hearing the message of recovery. And that's what we're all about. You know, we're here to carry the message. We're here to make sure that anybody that walks through that door can hear the message, can have the opportunity to recover. And, you know, it's not up to me to keep people out of here, you know, and I take that very seriously because an addict shouldn't die because they can't hear the message. I... You know, my sponsor, Sydney, used to say, I don't care what you do, but just don't ever hurt another addict. You know, you may not help everybody, but do your best every day to never hurt another addict. And for the most part, you know, for the last two decades, I've been really working at doing that. You know, I really try to think before I speak. You know, I really try to make sure that I don't hurt another addict because I don't want someone's death on my conscience, really. Um, I think that, you know, sometimes, and I think it's good for groups to do a group inventory. You know, every once in a while in our home group, we'll say, you know, are we really serving the addict that still suffers? Are we really being welcoming enough? You know, what's the atmosphere of recovery in my home group? And, you know, we change things up in our home group as a result of that conversation that we had at a home group meeting. You know, we started, we decided that because it's a meeting with a lot of clean time and it's a very intimidating meeting for some people, you know, what we ended up doing was part of our format now is that we go around and introduce ourselves so that People feel more welcomed. People get to know, at least, you know, I know Janice. Janice comes to the meeting. I can, you know, I know for when I was new, I felt so warm inside when someone remembered my name, you know, and sometimes the only way I can remember somebody's name is during the introductions because I, I'm like brain dead sometimes, you know, and it helps me to know who's newer, to remember somebody's name so that I can go up to them after the meeting and say, you know, hi, how are you doing? You know, Joe, how are you doing, Kathy, or whatever, who was ever in the room. And I like that about my home group because we've tried our best to make it more welcoming. And, you know, 
I'm, I'm happy about that. You know, but we're a very quiet meeting. We only do one of the readings because we, we're a step meeting. And, you know, we read the step in its entirety in the, in the It Works How and Why. And, you know, it's a very different format. And that goes back to the fourth tradition. You know, we have a very different format in our, in our meeting as opposed to a lot of the meetings in the area that read every single reading. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Please don't take that out of this room that I said we should not be reading all the readings. <laughs> that's not what I mean. But every every meeting has the opportunity to say, you know, I just like what we started with here, that's a, a reading that I don't look at very often. And it's a wonderful reading, you know, and this group, made a decision to, to do that reading and nothing else. And that is okay. You know, that doesn't hurt Narcotics Anonymous as a whole. That doesn't have a bad effect on NA as a whole. That's the personality of that particular meeting, and that's okay. And each of us has our own message, you know. I'm married to a man, his message is usually hilarious, you know, and I'm just not that funny. But I... You know, I love to laugh. I love to hear speakers that, that make me laugh. But I like to hear the message. And, you know, our message is truly that any addict can come in here and find a way to recover. You know, once we're here, we never have to use again. That's the strongest message that we can give somebody walking into this room that, you know, once you're here, you absolutely can stay clean for as long as you want, that no matter what, you can get clean and recover. And that's the brilliance of our traditions. You know, that's the fifth tradition, which I wasn't asked to share on, but, you know, that, <laughs> that tradition is equally important. You know, and the whole, you know, humility, there's so many spiritual principles embodied into the traditions. And we don't always necessarily think about that. You know, love <laughs> is a spiritual principle that is found in the first tradition. You know, goodwill towards others is part of the first tradition. And that's all about love for me. And, you know, putting myself second to somebody else is part of the way that I act out on love sometimes. You know, if I think of somebody before myself, not in a doormat way, because I can go there too, <laughs> but truly as an equal, but thinking of myself, you know, less so that I can help somebody else. You know, when I pray every day, I ask God to help me, not to just help myself, but to help others. I've been saying my prayer that way for a very long time, and I believe that it gets me to be my right size. You know, because ego, as I mentioned earlier, you know, ego doesn't really have a place in my life today. Um, I like it to be sometimes, you know, I can kind of get off on it. But for the most part, you know, I need to be the right size. And that's humility for me. You know, I have assets and I have liabilities and, you know, I'm just a member no better than anybody else. I'm no better than the person with one day clean just because I have clean time. I may have more knowledge about some stuff. I may have more knowledge on how to stay here. I may have more knowledge on how to work the steps, but I'm no better than anybody else. And that's the essence of the traditions. You know, anonymity means that I'm no better or no worse than anybody else, that we're all equal. And equality is a principle that I believe is hard for a lot of addicts. I know that it was very difficult for me. When I got here, I felt less than everybody. But I wanted to make you think that I was smarter than you. And I used my intellect for a long time to make people feel less than me because I could get away with it. But also because it's, you know, it's what I knew. I came in here with that bag of tricks. And I've worked very hard at, you know, being teachable. And that's an aspect of humility. You know, being teachable means that I don't have all the answers. It goes back to the fourth tradition that, you know, 
it goes back to the second tradition as well. And that, you know, the one with all the answers is my loving God. And so, you know, I think that the traditions are in place, not as a weapon, but as a way to safeguard Narcotics Anonymous. You know, Bob and I used to joke around a lot about, you know, people would, and I don't hear this that much anymore, but, you know, about you're breaking the traditions. And, you know, that's a tradition violation. Well, how come nobody ever says, that's a six-step violation? (laughs) (laughs) Because nobody ever said that, but they'll tell you all about the tradition violations, (laughs) all the traditions you're breaking, but nobody ever says, you know, (laughs) you broke the seventh step. (laughs) So, you know, and... And I really, really believe that we can't work these traditions unless we work the steps. You know, like I started to say in the beginning, for me, if I haven't worked on my ego and self-centeredness, then there is no first tradition in my life because I don't care about unity when I'm in ego and self-centeredness and and all those defects that get coupled in there because it is all about me then. But when I've worked on, you know, the steps are an ego deflating process. The more we work the steps, the more it deflates our ego. And then I can roll up to the first tradition and try to live unity. You know, I try to live unity in my house today. It's not always possible. Recently, you know, I had to surrender because, you know, I believe that I know all this medical stuff. And, you know, my husband had a liver transplant and I became in control of his whole life, which was a character defect. But, you know, I was so flipped out about his health that I couldn't, like, I I had to spend every day like this, you know, because I was afraid he was going to die. And, this is, you know, Bob told me I only had to share on the traditions for four minutes and then I could talk about what I really wanted to talk about. <laughs> because I wasn't really sure what I was going to say about the traditions when I was asked to share on these traditions one through four. And so, you know, for me, and this is an aside from the traditions, but since I've been asked to speak and I feel like, I just want to share my gratitude because we never know where our life is going to take us. And I've had a very interesting life. I have so much gratitude for my foundation, which has saved my butt more often than not. And the past couple of years for me, it's been about the power of prayer. And my friend Butch, who passed away in December, started calling me the prayer warrior. Because for me, it's really been about the power of prayer. And that's how I've lived my life for the last few years. You know, many people have prayed for me and my husband. Many people have just been there for us in a way that I would never have believed was possible. And, you know, so the prayer thing has become my lifeline. And I've been able to walk through the most incredible things that I never imagined. I would never have imagined being able to walk through without leaving a path to destruction. And so for me, my gratitude really, really speaks loudly every day because, you know, when I got here, I really didn't care about anybody and I really hated myself. And I've been given the gift of love in so many ways. And I just feel so blessed. You know, I feel blessed in the middle. I felt blessed in the middle of not knowing what was going to happen to my life. And, you know, when I moved to Florida, I was really angry about being in Florida. And, you know... God and his ultimate wisdom, you know, and that's why I feel so strongly about God is the ultimate authority because God had a plan. And I didn't know what that plan was, but, and 
because I didn't know what the plan was, I was really pissed off. (laughs) And, you know, I left a path to destruction. I wasn't always living in the traditions when I first moved to Florida. And I pissed a lot of people off because I was really mad about being there. And I said some things about the Florida Fellowship that I should never have said. And I've since made amends for that. And uh, I continue to live those amends by not calling where I live the Redneck Riviera anymore. <laughs> and, or the People's Republic of Florida. <laughs> yeah, that's the shit, I mean, like, you know, that's the shit that I went there with. And it wasn't well received. <laughs> you know, but I have. I have made amends for that. And, you know, God in his infinite wisdom put us in Florida so that, you know, my husband could get a liver. And, you know, since we've been in Florida, I've gotten some gifts. And, you know, one gift is my husband's life, for one thing. He's going to put me in an early grave because he's probably going to live to be 100 now. (laughs) But, you know, I had the opportunity through the grace of God to realize some dreams since I moved to Florida. And that wouldn't have happened if I had stayed in LA. And as much as I didn't want to leave there, and, you know, what I've learned today is we live where our feet are. And I have to be satisfied. I have to practice being satisfied. I didn't know that. I, you know, that's why We get here, and it's a continual learning process, you know. On a regular basis, I find out things about myself that I never knew. That's, you know, denial. Denial means that we didn't know we didn't know. And for me, being teachable means that I'm willing to listen to my sponsor today. I'm willing to continue to work steps. I'm willing to search on a daily basis for what God's will for me is. I don't always know what God's will for me is. I do know what it isn't. It's not for me to use. It's not for me to hurt another addict. It's not for me to stay home and isolate. It's for me to participate in life. And, you know, I'm just so grateful that I've been here long enough to know that Narcotics Anonymous really works. And that I just need to keep coming back. So thank you. We have some time for anybody who would like to share. Floor is open. Okay, then. We'll close the meeting. Oh, you want to share? I'm sorry. Right here. Hi, Carly. Hi, Carly. Karen, thank you so much. Your your message touched me deeply. Um, And uh, the spirit of the traditions. I was looking forward to going to one of the traditions meetings. And and my buddy sponsor here said, I'm going to this one. And I wouldn't want to be anywhere else right at this moment. You did just a tremendous job sharing the gift of the heart. Uh, well, this whole time is, and the, and the traditions being our path to embracing the people in it, to making it real. I'm better than no one. No one's better than me. And the unity part of, you know, that we are a family with the same last name. And that it's not for us to decide what each other's nicknames are or how we talk when we first get here. But it is for us to share what works for us. And then it's, it's God's job the whole rest of it. You, you did so beautifully. And I, I just wanted to thank you very much. Thanks, Carly. Thank you. Anybody else? Sue? Julian, I'm an addict. Hi, Sue. Wow, thank you. I remember yesterday you said that the traditions were, weren't really a good thing, so you were worried about sharing on this, but they are your thing, if you not realize it. Um, I really got a lot out of what you said, especially you know, the home group stuff, some of the stuff I shared with you yesterday, that now I to remember the one and be able to internalize it and, and bring it back to the group. And every time you share, I hear gratitude completely and so much love and the passion that you've always had. So I do remember you, you know, remember you from when I got here. And, you know, I don't think that passion has ever died. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. 
And you've been an incredible part of example to me and to continue to be. But thanks for sharing. Well, I, well, me too. Hey, so. Thanks, sis. I didn't dress in the man. Yeah, no. I'm in agreement with CZ regarding the knowledge that you can share. It's actually the first time for me that I've ever heard someone really connect the steps to conditions. And I'm really grateful for that because that's obviously an area in my life that I just missed. The other thing is the strain that you continue to share. No, it always touches me. You know, I picked you, I, you know, I share, when I have shared, I've always said that I picked you because you were an Nazi. <laughs> and that was, like, in my, that was the image from years ago, 20 years ago. And what I realized is that that image isn't who you are. It's just what I remember. I brought this up. So I I am forever grateful for you being my hands. I've learned through the years that when you love someone, you tell them, I love you. I love you not. I love you forever for what you've done. So I'm listening to you. Thank you. Say it. I'm already going away. I'm too close to tears and starting running. This is probably the first time listening to a speaker oh, in a workshop, I thought. I wonder how soon I'll have a tape. <laughs> so I can listen again. I love you. Thank you. I love you too. Thank you, Lauren. If any of me Hi, Denise. I can't even hear your whole message because I didn't want to get up this morning. <laughs> but, uh, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to hear so many of your messages. The things that really you'd hope for me when you have to be 